What we're doing tonight uh, is having an open community meeting. And it's the first time the Knox Free of Knoxville State Investors has sponsored a, a neighborhood meeting anywhere. So we thought Park, I thought people involved thought Park Ridge would be a good place to start. And so in our monthly meetings, the Knoxville Real Estate Investor Association, Knox Rio, is a, um, a group of investors who come to a monthly meeting, almost like AA, and we talk about real estate in um, the way that investors think about real estate. And the first thing that we want people to, that are new to come into the meetings to think about, and it's what neighborhoods are all the time wanting to think about, is the what does the future look like? So investors make their money in the future. Home buyers are investors who are hoping to make money in the future. And so we start every meeting with a disclaimer. And everybody should be able to read this and you've got a copy. But what I want people to do and to understand is that uh, I'm in the real estate, my name is Victor Jernigan again, and I'm in the real estate business to make a profit. The Knox Real Estate Investors is owned by GIB Incorporated, which is a real estate brokerage firm in the state of Tennessee, and it's organized to make a profit. That's the goal. You don't always make money in real estate. Uh, the program that we're doing tonight is purely for informational purposes only. It's purely for education. Nobody's going to give it investment advice or you should take investment advice. Always absolutely positively consult with professionals before you make any real estate decision. As I say in our meetings all the time, investing involves risk, tax implications, and the possibility of financial loss. Real estate investing is the only way that the majority of people in America can create generational wealth, if you do it correctly. If you do it incorrectly, you create generational poverty, which is the reason we say never ever be in a hurry only you can decide when to make an act. Buying real estate is one of the very last things that cannot be done by committee because somebody has to sign the documents as the buyer. So it's important that you never take anything as a fact. Don't take anything that I say as a fact. The reason we set up like this with tables is so people can take notes. We want you to take notes on everything that I say, go home, Google it, go to ehow.com, about.com, or any of the other websites, and make the effort to prove what I'm talking about is wrong. The more you do that kind of research, the better neighbor you will be, the better homeowner you will be, the better investor you will be. And it's really important to understand that you never need to be in a hurry to buy real estate. And this is where Park Ridge comes in, because I, I end every presentation the same way, don't ever be in a hurry to buy and sell real estate. It goes on 360, 24-7, 365. We've been doing it exactly the same way in the United States since the Panic of 1893. So, uh, the uh, I don't get on Facebook very much. Um, maybe 10 minutes. How, how people have time to post on Facebook, I know it's a <laughs> So, um, but I've gotten on Facebook a couple of times to see that there's um, some people who don't have a basic understanding of how real estate investing works, who have different views of where the neighborhood should go, and different dynamics that are going on in the community. This presentation is from um, the, the, our real estate meeting uh, on the 10th, so three weeks ago. And it's following the basic outline that we, we had in that meeting, so everybody can sort of get a feel for what we talk about in the meetings. Because again, Real estate investing is about making money in the future. So what happens is, every, uh, every topic was, uh, every political decision involves real estate. There is no decision that is ever made in the world of politics that doesn't make any difference what it is that doesn't involve a piece of dirt. Somebody is making a decision to do something somewhere or to do something else somewhere else. But there is always real estate involved. And as property owners or people who are living in a community that are renting in the community, what is happening with the politics in the community really begins to have a, a, a really serious impact over a three to five, seven year period of time in the future. But the first thing we're going to do, um, if, uh, 
this is free. Uh, the, uh, if anybody buy, needs, gets anything printed, you get any kind of school supplies, you buy anything at Office Max or Office Depot, right now, um, you can do it, you can make a note and do it anytime. But if you text Knox Rea, K N O X R E I A, to 555-888, you come back with a little card that is a uh, Office Depot, Office Max uh, store purchasing card. And the materials that we printed up tonight, it was, a, it was $180. After we used the store purchasing card, it was $63 out of the door. So it, it's free, there's no gimmick to it. <laughs> it's uh, something that uh, everybody should use, and if you, as I say, if you've got kids and you need school supplies, it's a great thing to have. It should, it should come back with a, just a little card, Knox Rea up in the corner, uh, SPC number. So, Knox Rea, 555-888. So, in, in the meeting, we go over the statistics of what's going on in the dynamic to help investors understand how they can begin to um, see, use the information when they're either making a decision to buy a piece of property or if they're a real estate agent talking about a listing or if they're a real estate agent who already has a listing and they want to counsel a seller on whether they should take the offer or not. So most everything that I provide in every meeting is free to everybody. The information is available. It uh, is available to everybody. Um, this comes off the MLS website, so you can download this yourself. What I do is provide the thought process behind how you use the information. So, the market update, and I've been using this every month this year, there are simply not enough houses anywhere in the Knoxville metro area. So, in uh, August, the end of August, uh, there were 5,979 listings, down about 600 listings since June, listed in the marketplace. There's 2,300 pending sales that are separate from what's listed, but that's also down just a little bit from June. So what happens is 46% or 20, 2,200 sales, 2,231 sales, um, and 46% of those sales close in under 30 days. Everybody see that right there, closed in under 30 days. What's also important is that 23% of all the sales, eight, over 800 sales, were cash transactions. Now 90%, 95% of all cash transactions are investors who are buying property, right? So 25% in round numbers of every sale this year has been to an investor somewhere. Now, I've modified this a little bit, but in 2011, the median sales price across the year of all housing sold in the Knoxville MLS. 2011, it was 135,000. In 2011, I use a service, a local market monitor. Everybody wants to write that down, it's a paid service. The local market monitor provides the information that a about uh, 2,000 banks and credit unions used to value their own real estate portfolios. And in 2011, they had estimated that the equilibrium price in Knoxville was up $170,000. So we were $40,000 about where, their, where they thought the market should be. Every year that things have gone forward, it's continued to move up. Last, in 2016, they said the equilibrium price was $196,000 and we were still at a price of $159,000. So what this is, is that you have these people who are watching everything that's going on in Knoxville, what our job growth is, what the job growth in the metro area is, what the job growth in East Tennessee is. They're looking at how many housing starts, how many new bank formations, how many, because if you have new banks that are forming, you have more desire to lend money. So you wind up with a situation that uh, at the end of 2000, so right now, we're projecting a median price this year of $175,000. So in six years, in simple math, the price has gone up, 40, the median price, half below, half above, has gone up $40,000. Today, 69% of all the listings are higher than $175,000. 
it's entirely possible that next year we're going to be at a, a, a median price of about $205 to $210. Local market monitor says we need to be where the opportunity is up to $218,000 median number. So if you're an investor, if you're watching the market, if you're watching what's going on in the MLS, if you're watching what's being listed, uh, you can see that there is the opportunity for properties to continue to go up in value and we would still be under where comparable markets to Knoxville are in the United States. And the reason that that's important is if you're a homeowner and you're thinking about selling, do you want to sell now? Do you want to sell a little later in the future? Is now a, time, is, is now a good time to sell? If you're thinking about renting property, then you've got to get a feel for where the rental market is. I can absolutely get really wonkish into the weeds of this stuff. So if I get sidetracked, this is, there is no agenda and no topic. I'm just talking on slides. Anybody at any time interrupt with any question that involves real estate. It doesn't make any difference to me, whatever it is. So what's happening is investors are pouring into the market because there is no new house construction. The median household income in Knoxville is about $52,000. That pretty much limits you to a new construction house about, against that value of about $250,000, $230,000, something in that range. So right now, it's almost impossible to get a new home under construction in the county for under $200,000. It's impossible in the city to develop a new subdivision for new lots with housing under $300,000. So on day one, there will be no new construction of any consequence coming forward. There's just no capital to do it, and there's nowhere you can build it because of the way the banking system works under the Dodd-Frank rules. Now, investors have a different situation. So if you're a builder, this is, you get into the weeds, but it, it impacts Communities like Park Ridge and South Knoxville extensively because you have an existing housing stock that is in general valued under $275,000. And again, in just round numbers, 275 is the sort of a mental number that it's easy to keep in your mind as to what the FHA lending limit is. So if you have a 620, there's a lending officer in the room that can correct it, but I think if you have a 625 or 640 credit score, you can get an FHA loan with 3.5% down, and um, with closing costs and everything, you'll be in for about 5%. So for about $12,000 all in, you can buy a new home, or a home, any home, right? So what happens is, right now, in Knoxville, under $250,000, in July, there was a 90-day supply of houses on the MLS. Now it's under 60 days, and if you drop down to $175,000, it's a 17-day, when I did the meeting, it was a 17-day supply of housing, below $175,000. What do you mean by 17-day supply? 17 day supply? So that mean? At, at, at the current sales rate, on the previous month, Everything that's listed would be sold in the next 17 days. So when you hear people, and that's important to understand because when you hear people talk about, man, I, I, make, I tried to make an offer on that house, but it was sold before I got there. I, wanted, I, I thought about buying that house, but it was under contract, and I didn't get a chance to even look at it. That house sold so fast, uh, I was driving across town, I called my wife, and we never got to get inside the door. And the reason is, there's no inventory. And over the last, six, seven years since the bottom of the recession in 2011, you wind up with you have more and more and more people who are qualified to buy. Um, they've begun to work out some student debt, they've begun to get uh, some savings put back in place, people who used to own a home, who lived in an apartment, and now they're wanting to go back and buy a house. And so they've been accumulating some money. So there are lots of buyers that are out there. So what is happening is that and again, I don't want this to be some kind of lecture. Anybody can interrupt, but thank you for the question. The, the thought process is that as buyers are accumulating more cash and fewer homes are on the market, people who want to buy 
$30,000 house, they can't get to the door. It's getting sold. It's getting sold. They make an offer to buy the $130,000 house at $125,000, and the house sold uh, in a bidding war for $140,000. And they do that about eight or ten times, maybe 12 times. And all of a sudden they say, you know, we need to call mom or dad, and we need to save another few thousand dollars because we're going to bid $150,000. We're not going to wait around. If we see something listed for $130,000, we're going to bid $150,000, and we're going to own that house. And for investors, that's extremely important to understand because that is what creates the opportunity to have repaired value in a home. You buy a home that needs repairs, the people who are buying a $130,000, $150,000, dollars house do not have the money to buy uh, the home and do the repairs before they move in. It almost never happens under $250,000. So you wind up with this feeding frenzy that is occurring under the $200,000 mark. And it only accelerates over time because you have more people coming to the Knoxville market. Is everything, everything making sense so far? It's going to be a test at the end. I'm going to everybody. <laughs> so, in Park Ridge, uh, I've seen on Facebook pages that people say that Park Ridge is being targeted because there's people, we buy houses, signs, and uh, there's letters that go out to people uh, we'd like to buy your house. Well, let me tell you, Park Ridge isn't alone. <laughs> They're in every single neighborhood in the greater Knoxville metro area. I mean, I know people that have got four or five hundred signs that they put out over the course of a couple of months. I know people that do thousands of letters, want to sell, they're called want to sell letters. Do you want to sell your home? The market's been moving up. Would you like to know what your home is worth? Um, I got one of those last week. Um, you'll get one every week. So they go, so it depends on how, who's buying. They all come off of a mail list. They're all form letters. Uh, anybody in this room can buy the mail list. It depends on what you want to buy. There's all kinds of mail lists you can buy. We have a program with uh, the RIA group that you can pay $75 a month. and It's just unbelievable the, the information you have from CRS data systems. So you can create any list you want of any number of people you want, how long people have lived in their house, how, many, how old do you think they are by how long they've lived in the house, and, and send focus letters. And it's all point and click. There's no targeting going on for Park Ridge other than the fact that there's a lot of energy in the Park Ridge community, which we're going to in just a minute. But the want to sell letters are um, something you can buy, you can have all kinds of stationery, it's all on a computer, it's all off of a mail list, and off of zip codes. This real estate sign, uh, real estate investor seeks training, 100000 a year, call or text. I am going to do a YouTube video calling that guy out. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to do that. I threatened to do it at the meeting, and Brian reminded me. That's my friend Brian Delay over here. Um, so, um, and the other one, so that was on the exit of the, that was the Cedar Bluff off ramp for um, uh, Cedar Bluff ramp off of Interstate 40. And this, uh, I buy houses any condition, 866, Rick buys. Um, I used that sign and there were four or five people in the real meeting that knew this guy, Rick. I don't know who he is. But that was in front of the Office Max, Office Depot, on Kingston Pike, where these flyers come, where, where the handouts come from. So they just put it right there. There's a Hardy's right there. So you're pulling out, you see his sign. So they're everywhere. And the reason is that they're everywhere is if you can get in front of a deal today, there's probably somebody who will pay you to get out of the way. And in real estate, there's a term called wholesaling, and you'll hear that term used. The real term is you're assigning a contract into the weeds. Real estate investors monetize information. I don't do anything with a hammer, a saw, I'm not allowed to use tools. I'm not, as you can see from my arm, I'm not I'm going to have to be barred from uh, throwing the ball with my dog. Uh, so you wind up with a situation that I just pay attention to information and I invest capital where I believe that information is leading me. Investing in real estate 
is when somebody buys a piece of property and they're going to buy that property because they have a better idea as to how to do the repairs to that house. They've got an all new thought process that 35 people have looked at the home. It's completely condemned. I've got an idea that's going to fix this house and I'm going to be able to get it done cheaper than anybody else. It's kind of like uh, name that song in five tunes, name that song in four tunes, right? Mm -hmm. So you have people who are investors who are buying houses because they're going to work on the houses themselves. I can't buy that house. In Knoxville, Tennessee, and it's a broad statement, but in general, if the repairs are $30,000 or less, an investor like myself has no chance to buy the house. Zero. Because there are so many people, like Tyrone right here, who is, by the way, great electrician. If you need electrical work, right there's a guy. <laughs> so, you wind up with a situation that a guy who wears a tool belt and two of his friends can go together and buy that house and on $30,000 in repairs to most properties, less than $10,000 of it is material. So I've got to hire labor. I've, you know, I've got to employ labor. Labor deserves a profit if I'm hiring it, right? So it winds up that it's almost impossible. So over time, I only look for properties that have been on the market for more than 101 days, which means they've got a problem. Uh, and therefore, the repairs are most likely more than $50,000. That's my model. Every investor has their own model. And I talk about what I do and where I invest at every RIA meeting and where I think other people should be investing because of changes that are being done in the political environment and or zoning laws which are being created, right? Which are going to drive value in the future. I don't care under any circumstance what something sold for 60 days ago. That value trap notion of being able to say, well, my house has got to be worth this because that house was worth X, that doesn't mean anything to me, right? If they're going to close the middle school and all of a sudden my kids are being bused for an hour in each direction, right? If that might be important to some of the people who have kids at Holston Middle, for example. So what happens is all of a sudden the property in Gibbs becomes worth more money because now the kids aren't going to be bused. You've got a high school kid and your middle and your, your, your middle school can go to school together. Your high schooler can take your middle school and you don't have to go on a bus for an hour in the morning so they come down to Holston Hills. Right? The decision to build Holst Gibbs Middle School increased all the property values in Gibbs and decreased all the values because of uncertainty around who's going to go to Holston Middle. Because people didn't know whether the kids were going to be bused or not, or whether Holston Middle was going to be closed. Right? So, again, what we talk about is paying attention to what's going on. And so much on that I've seen on Facebook is that people are saying, uh, you've got this going on, or you've got this going on, or somebody's got an agenda, or somebody else has got an agenda, or um, um, people are trying to take advantage of other people. And let me say, the market is what's driving everything in Knoxville, Tennessee. You can see just from the tracking of our median sales price over the last five years. You've got investors running everywhere. Nobody's paying thousands of dollars a month to send letters out unless it's working. Nobody's paying thousands of dollars a month to put signs up unless it's working. So, I failed PowerPoint, by the way. I, I, I saw a PowerPoint presentation today that was just like really cool. It moved. It opened up, slides came in from this way and that way. So, we've got all this dynamic going on, and urban changes everything. And the reason urban changes everything is that Florida has 23 million people. We have about 800,000 people a year moving to Florida. But there's still, you know, uh, in the Keys, there's still people without power. And in uh, Naples, there are people that live in Naples who are not going to be in their house for a year or maybe two years. So, just as a broad brush, open question, can somebody give you the difference between people who are living in Houston after Hurricane Harvey and the people who are living in Florida after Irma? If you just make a broad generalization. The broad generalization, in my view, is that people who live in Houston work in Houston. And they're going to stay in Houston. People who live in Florida 
They've got choices. They've got money. They've got time. They've got choices. And they can choose to live wherever they want to live. And as I was coming back up the interstate from a meeting in Chattanooga, the second day after the evacuation notice came in, I told the story at the real meeting. It, it wasn't the first Range Rover that passed me, or the second Range Rover that passed me. It was the third Range Rover, and then the Escalade. And then here comes, a, uh, here comes a Ferrari. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Every car that passed me for about 15 minutes had uh, three digits to the left of the common in its price tag. It, Brian pointed out that they were all going to the Highlands of North Carolina to check on their guns and the cash. <laughs> but the point is that they do not need to go back to Florida. And I'm going to say there are going to be a lot of people who are not going to go back to Florida. We, I know of real estate agents who have shared stories with me that have said that people who came up here evacuating from Irma are already buying houses and telling their friends to buy houses. And one of them made a comment at the closing table, which was, I'm going to head and buy now because there's going to be hundreds of people that I know that are going to be leaving Naples. Now, maybe they come to Knoxville. I make the over-under number, let's just make it simple, over the next two years, let's say between people that leave Florida and people that don't go to Florida, you've got a million people. 500,000 move out, 500,000 don't go down there. So is the easy number for us to say 20,000 people that are going to be moving into this market? I mean, that's, that's a made up number. It could be 1,000 people. But it's easy to say 20,000 people over two years that are going to choose to stay here or come here and be safe. Because this is the operative thing right here. And this is what everybody, if you don't come away with anything in the meeting, come away with this. You've heard a thousand times in real estate, it's location, 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 right? Come on, please say yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is really, people invest in safety. And this is really important to understand as an investor, as a homeowner and a renter who's about to get a rent increase, right? Or maybe, your rent is coming up and you want to negotiate for a decrease. Because without exception, when people perceive that they physically or their children are no longer safe, they will move. <clears throat> Absolutely, positively, they will move. More importantly, those who can move immediately, move immediately, and those who can organize their lives to move in the next year, they move in the next year. So after they look for safe, and, and the, the, con, the reverse is true, the converse is true, in that people, when they invest, they, they may not say it, but subconsciously what they're looking for is to buy in a neighborhood that they perceive to be the safest place for them to invest, for their own safety, for their money to be safe, and their future, for their money to grow, and their children to grow. So the three things that you really are looking for is a place that is safe for the individual, a, a place that is safe for the money to be invested, and a place that is safe with a future that is growing. Because money's made in appreciation of real estate, not the investment in real estate. You can make money with the investment, but it's the appreciation and the reduction of debt that actually creates wealth. So you wind up with 17, if we just pick the number, the natural growth that the Metropolitan Planning Commission says is we have about 1% natural growth uh, in the greater national market, about 8,500 people a year. The things that I'm reading say that that's two or 3,000 people under what is actually coming into the marketplace. And now you've got Irma coming, which could bring 20, 10,000 people a year more. And we've got five to 7,000 new jobs that are coming online from June of this year to December of next year. Now, everybody heard about Denzo, right? Denzo is adding 1,000 new jobs in one county. So you got the Pelican, you got Alcoa Highway, right? The Pelican Parkway, one end down there is Denzo. They're adding 1,000 jobs at an average of $26 an hour 
Um, and the, all the jobs are going to be added between June. Um, the bulk of the jobs are going to be added between June and December. There's going to be two or three hundred that are added in 2019. The uranium processing facility. How many people are familiar with that going on in Oak Ridge? This is the biggest untalked about project I've ever been around. It's the largest construction project in the history of the state of Tennessee. There are 2,400 construction jobs being created in Oak Ridge from June of this year through December of last year. And the reason is their goal is to be 100% under construction in January of 2019. Now as an aside from this, those jobs, again, picking a number, are $80,000 a year jobs, and nobody who has those, or is going to have those jobs or has those jobs lives in Oak Ridge, Anderson County, Knox County, Blunt County, Loudoun County, or Jefferson County. They're all going to be coming from somewhere else. Eight, about $80,000 a year is what the construction jobs are going to have. Yes. Yeah, for the uranium process. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> as an aside, and these numbers come from, again, I'm not telling you anything, I told you at the beginning of the meeting, take nothing I say as a statement of fact. Your goal is to prove me wrong. Please. So, that number comes from uh, the uh, Tennessee Department of Economic Development, which projected how many other thousands of jobs that would be created in each incremental 10 mile ring around the uranium processing facility. Now if you go backwards north from Oak Ridge, we're going to say that most of the people are going to want to live south of Oak Ridge on this side of the river. Right? And I'm saying it's Dollar Springs. Dollar Springs is a really nice place. I'm just saying that maybe they're going to come this way. And so what happens is you've got families that are going to be relocating that are going to make somewhere as a family income to pick a number and I'm just making the number up because it's easy to do hundred and ten to hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year so all of a sudden you've got a whole group of wealthy people that are coming to town you've got workers in Denzo making twenty six dollars an hour now they may be here in town the Denzo workers could come from this area but if they're coming from this area, they've left a job somewhere else, and somebody's got to pay somebody else to take that job. So right now, according to uh, Governor Haslam's office, when they did the announcement for Denzo, there's a 1% unemployment rate in Knox County. Um, I was with somebody the other day who took a picture uh, uh, of a uh, we're hiring sign that somebody posted out in front of their business. And what was really interesting, he told me uh, that it was just like when you buy a new car and you're really excited about getting a new car, and then you get on the road and it looks like everybody's driving the same car. <laughs> he took that picture and it seemed like everything, everywhere he went, everybody had signs out, we're hiring, apply now. Starting position, $10, starting position, $15, many more realize. Right? So we've got this real strong wage inflation that's occurring in Knoxville. So people who were making $35,000, $40,000 a year are now making fifty. dollars So if you're making $50,000, what price house do you buy? Yeah, $230,000, right? So not only do you have the people that are living here wanting to buy more and saving up more money, the people who have been looking for years because they've already got jobs that's fifty, sixty, seventy thousand, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, and they're looking to buy, but now you've got all these other people that are making more money, and so they want to say, I want to move out of this rental. It's a really nice rental. We've been here three years. But let's buy a house. I do want to buy a house. So what happens is you look at how this job creation is occurring and the ripple effect that it's having on housing, and you compare that to new construction starts, Compare that to new subdivision developments that are being created. And that's all easy to find. It's all available on the MPC, from the MPC. Anybody can get it. MPC, got a phenomenal MPC that is overworked and underpaid. 
so you wind up with a situation where um, the demand for housing is far exceeding, far exceeding what can be built as new construction. So what is left? Existing housing stock. The existing housing stock, right? What does Park Ridge have? Existing housing stock. Holston Hills, Chilhowee Hills, Lincoln Park, everything out in Severe Avenue and South Knox. We'll get it done in just a minute. <laughs> so everybody together so far? This is this is the market dynamics that is impacting everything. <coughs> so and the reason that this is important is the topic is <coughs> every political decision is a real estate decision, right? <coughs> so I'm thinking again, anybody can ask any question anytime. Um, so there is this meeting involves politics. It's um, so this was the sign that uh, was used, uh, the same slide as last month, about political decisions that have been made in different places. The city of Dayton spent two million dollars. They bought 80, 87 acres is an important number in this slide. That's where they use it, of course. 87 acres. The city of Dayton bought, spent two million. They enlarged the park. They spent another two million developing their business park. They landed uh, uh, Nicoya Tires. It's a 400 jobs, 360 million dollar plant in Dayton, Tennessee. So the investors, I tell people they should go to Dayton because they're going to add, they've got room for another plant the size of this, and the COI is saying that they're going to add a thousand jobs before it's over with. So you wind up with, in two, that's 2017. In 2013, the city council in, in, um, implemented a, um, the NSKIP small area plan, which was a restriction against future development of property in the NSKIP neighborhood. What's interesting about that is that there were about 400 acres that were zoned by right for up to 12 units an acre. The neighborhood didn't want any more apartments, so the people who owned, now I'm just, I have no idea what I'm saying, this is true, but this is my view, if I had owned apartments in Inskip, I would have been 100% in favor of passing a moratorium so that there would never be more apartments in Inskip. So the city, by fiat, took away the right to develop the property for any greater density than it was already developed. So if you were a homeowner and you owned a, you owned a, a lot on which you could have built a fourplex, but you only got one house, all that can ever be built on that house, on that property is one house. They took away the potential of 4,000 housing units in Inskip with one suite because the Inskip homeowners didn't want any more apartments. We have enough of those people in our neighborhood. The reason that I'm sensitive to that is that when Inskip was actually formed, I've got the newspaper clippings from the 48, 49, when the people who lived in Inskip had an emergency meeting because somebody was going to buy the 100 acre farm uh, that was that is Inskip today, right? And divide it into four lots and five lots per four lots per acre, and nobody should be allowed to develop property at four lots per acre. It's just not the way Knoxville is done, and it's going to ruin the aesthetic of Knoxville. So in 1948, everybody that lived out there had an emergency meeting to try to stop the rezoning of the, of the property. But, you know, obviously it didn't work. The houses get built, fast forward, and now the people that are out there don't want any more apartments because they don't want the property accepted by anybody anymore. The, but because there can be no, you're on public transportation, you're on one interstate exit, uh, two interstate exits from downtown, you're 15 minutes from the university, and heavy traffic. It's on public transportation. It's got great. It's got. It's a great neighborhood. Great location. No chance for future development. So what happens is there's no incentive for people who own apartments to raise and redo and modify and keep the apartments current. There's no incentive for people who own rental property because there are no market forces which will make them keep the properties up because the people want to live there because they work on Broadway, they work on merchants, they work at a hospital out north. There's no reason to because no competitor can come in. So what's, what's happening in Inskia is that property values over the last three years have begun to decline. 
the rental, uh, the housing market, the rental markets continue to increase. The housing market has uh, been stable or declining in price. So you wind up with the next one. Marshall City Council rejects. This just happened in September. The City Council voted to reject the FedEx zoning. Everybody know where Midway Road is? Everybody in this room should know where Midway Road is because uh, it's the last exit out of Knoxville on Interstate 40. Yeah. It's where the business, the Knox County Business Park was scheduled to go eight years ago. Knox County has invested $20 million or $30 million out there on land that they keep running into a bus saw and trying to develop. Yet across the street from that, on the Midway exit, there's a piece of property that's been zoned commercial forever and FedEx came into town and they were going to build the same size facility in Knoxville that they have in Nashville. They were saying that it was going to be $25 million in new construction and it was going to create 200 new full-time jobs. The people who live out there don't want that, inter inter that interstate exit to be developed under any circumstance. They protested and the city council voted to deny FedEx the zoning and so FedEx didn't get it. I, I don't know that they've given up on that property, but where I think FedEx is going to go is out there next to H.T. Hackney in Rome County, which puts that much more pressure on the west end of, on Loudoun County and the west end of Knox County. People who live in Park Ridge who could have been easy out there, you know, 12 minutes from here, 15 minutes that direction, uh, could, could have applied for a job, it could have had enormous impact on ancillary jobs, because every job that's created that pays $20 an hour creates between one and three other jobs in the local economy. <clears throat> Do you know any of the issues that the people out there on the Midway? They don't want to develop. Period. End of story. Hackney, actually. Uh, it's karst topography because there's, there's sinkholes in the area. There's uh, The interstate exit isn't designed to handle that kind of traffic, even though the money's already in place to rebuild the entire exit. Uh, there's not enough power, even though there's KB substations in place. So they've been against it because they don't want that intruding into the rural character, the last rural area in Knox County. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm biased in this conversation, so everybody should look up Midway Road and make your own judgments. <laughs> if you can't see my bias coming through, please. <laughs> so, now, so also at the September meeting, and I pointed this out because um, the September meeting, the city council approved, and it just went on through. If Del Lope hadn't mentioned it, I wouldn't have caught it. You, they approved $400,000 for a matching grant of a million five from the federal government for a transportation study and uh, for um, the creation of the Greenway walking track. Del Lope asked, did, the, did that, was that secure construction cost or was that soft cost included? And it turns out that the city has now obligated themselves to a million five hundred thousand dollars in soft costs plus the four hundred thousand dollars for a grant that's going to come from the federal government for from a department which may not exist in 24 months right but the city has committed itself to the study of building a greenway from Middlebrook Pike through the tank farm out um, uh, first street uh, out to where um, the Victor Ash Park is Perfect. It's a mile and a half long. Third. Uh, I'm sorry? Third. Third, third period. Thank you. Um, so, and the reason that that's important, and I do this at all the rehab meetings, I don't do it in every meeting, but I do them in at least five month meetings, six meetings a month, a year, where I talk about people should begin to pay attention because in the next two or three years, it's going to really begin to drive value. And so what happens is there is a 100% correlation between increasing walkability score and property values increasing. As soon as a neighborhood, I tell everybody as investors, as soon as you hear that a park, a walking trail is funded, buy anything in that neighborhood. I don't care whether it's listed and you think it's at full value, buy it. Because once that walking trail is built, property values will go up between eight and 15%. It takes about a year or a year and a half for that to happen. It's another whole conversation about money and finance, but you buy as the walkability score goes up. 
And so, when you look at this, and you look at where Victor Ash Park is, and you look at where to buy, where I told people that they needed to buy it was the Westview neighborhood. And Keep that and it runs down the middle of it. And now we're getting into the real impact, the two titanic Teutonic, Teutonic, Teutonic plates that are rubbing against each other. Tectonic. Tectonic. Thank you very much. I knew, it was, I knew I was in that word somewhere. <laughs> Uh, how did the people spell anything before you had that red squiggly line on it? <laughs> uh, so this is South Knoxville. This is the first district. One, the, the second greenway that was approved was the Mary Vestal Greenway, which connects to Fort Dickerson Park and all through here. Now, in the back of the room, Joe, hold your hand up. This is the guy that greened up this project 10 years ago, 12 years ago. The well, I started dreaming about 20 years ago, but the uh, vision plan and the implementation plan were dated 2006. So years the regulating plan which is form based zoning is one year younger, 2007. So you wind up with a situation that the reason that this is important is that these two projects right here, remember, so you've got the Imes Park, which everybody knows is, everybody's converting into biking trails, converting into uh, hiking trails, um, everybody, so first value, walking trail, second value, unobstructed view of a park. Golf course views have better views, lake views have better views, better, are, are worth more money, golf course views are worth more money, right? Unobstructed view of a park. So you wind up with the city has transferred millions and millions and millions of dollars in value to this market by creating a place that people want to live. Now what happens is, the first district, and everybody should have one of these, they're printed up in color thanks to the, and if you didn't text Knox Reese 555 it's not my fault, right? So this just gives everybody an idea, and Park Ridge is just this little bitty area right here in the sixth district. This is where the Sixth District all goes to. Burlington's out here. Everybody can see what's going on. I spent um, four hours three weeks ago <coughs> driving around on a Friday afternoon with a little guy looking to find something in the Colonial Village Lake Forest area after you go past the Stone Road and go up over the hill in this area right here in, in the First District. Four hours. We found three houses with signs. Absolutely true here. We found three houses with signs. All were sold in less than 72 hours on market. All three houses had um, were three bedrooms, two baths, no garage. They'd all been remodeled, and they had sold between 120 and 140 dollars a square foot. There was one new construction home that had paid twenty-five thousand dollars for the lot. They had multi they built they, they built the house a little bigger than what they originally planned, so they had it listed for two hundred thousand dollars. It's under construction, and they closed the contract at two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. So it's not Park Ridge is being picked on. It's not East Knoxville, right? It is the market dynamic that everybody's looking for a place to live that they can afford. And so those houses in South out here are the same situation. They're 1,250, they're, they're the classic, you can see them everywhere in Knoxville. Uh, three bedroom, two bath, three bedroom, bath and a half, rancher, all built in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And people are getting, they're paying their 1,250 square feet and they're paying $150,000 for it, $140 a square foot. And it, if they need to bring another three or four, five thousand dollars in cash to close it, they'll do that, right? So now we have in the sixth district, it's Wynn and Jennifer, and this is the existing historic area right here, and this is the expansion area right here. There are 558 new parcels, with, and I'm estimating the market value. This is my estimate value between 40 and 50 million dollars in value that are going to be included in the uh, new expansion overlay. And it is more than 87 acres in size. And I just saw that and I thought, man, that's pretty interesting. 
David Tennessee buys 87 acres next to an industrial park and creates $360 million in construction, 450 jobs, going to be $1,000 in the near future. Also taking 87 acres and looking to put on a zoning overlay that will restrict the development forever. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but these are the facts. And again, Google. Joe's project along the South Waterfront was a great vision, and uh, the people who have bought it are really developing everything along the water. So if you're on um, the Henley Street Bridge and you go across the bridge on Henley Street to the left is what these two buildings are that are being built right here. There's a big park that comes in. Um, Joe, what's the name of street in front of the plaza? The plaza. That's the plaza park. Plaza. I can't think of that little street right there. The old hospital. The old Baptist. Yeah. Baptist. Yeah. Baptist. Yeah. Baptist. Yeah. Baptist. Yeah. yeah. This is where Baptist used to be. The, the Regal. Regal building is right here. So this is 303 apartments that are all market rate. The market rate for these apartments, I think, will be. You'll, you'll see the one bedroom units at about $900 to $1,000 a month. The three bedroom, two bath uh, will be somewhere around $2,200, $2,400 a month. Can you go back one slide? Sure, sure, sure. When you say A7, define you. Uh, everything is in purple. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There's houses or they're going to build houses. It's all, uh, it's all developed. Everything in here is developed. Okay. It's all developed. They're just going to rezone it? They're going to rezone it and put in. Uh, the same type of historic overlay that is on uh, the part of Park Ridge now that's got the black signs. Yeah. Uh, so the, the historic zoning overlay uh, is, we, I'll be happy to answer any questions on historic zoning. But, but the reason that it's important is that it's already developed. There's already housing on it, people are already living there. And I'm estimating the current market value of the houses to be between 40 and 50 million. So there's a lot of lots today in that area. You make money. And if you've been to one of our RIA meetings, the reason this is important is that we started telling people to buy in Park Ridge almost four years ago. So we've been telling people to go to Park Ridge and buy for four years. I told people to begin buying in South Knoxville um, in 2013. At the end of 2013, I wrote an, I wrote an article about that, why, was, why South Knoxville was the best place in Knoxville to buy property for the next seven years. So you think you buy in 2014, it'll double in price by 2017. And I think it's more than double, as a matter of fact. So, as a point of reference, I know nobody in this room knows me. But I've been in the real estate business forever. I'm old. I did my first transaction when I was 21. Over the years, I did the location analysis and selected the properties and acquired the properties for about 50 Weigel stores. I would buy stores for Weigel that would not be built on for 15 years after we purchased it, after he purchased the property. I did location, I've done bank branches for local banks, I've done uh, where they have wanted to know where growth was going to be, where they've been wanting to buy property that couldn't be bought. My on projects that I have acquired and rezoned and sold for development, there's about $250 million in residential construction in the Knoxville area that I'm directly responsible for. About $150 million in commercial construction. And I only say that as a point of reference that when I say that you, your goal is to prove me wrong, it will make you a better investor if you can. So to your point, if you bought lots in Park Ridge three years ago, two years ago, you would have been increasing in value, probably double or triple the money that you would pay for a lot three or four years ago. So you wind up with, this is on the left side of him, back to him is to Ridge. This is all gets to be important. The left side is, uh, this is what's there on the right side, so here's the Hill Street Bridge. This is all about apartments, there's Regal, that's the Gay Street Bridge. This on the left side is going to be a 134-unit student housing complex, 450 uh, bedrooms. They expect it to be 100% occupied. They expect the apartments to be 100% occupied. There, this is a home suites uh, by Hyatt. It's 120. I think it's 120 rooms. That, that could be wrong, but it's uh, it's a brand new hotel on the south side of the river. 
because there are so many people traveling to Knoxville to go biking on the bike trails and they have no place to stay. <laughs> 85 or 90 percent of all the Airbnb rentals in Knoxville are uh, from downtown Knoxville south of the river. So um, there's going to be three four restaurants uh, that will be developed here. There's a retail area. There's the, there's the plaza that Joe was talking about that connects to the river wall. It's a $160 million project, and they got $40 million from the city of Knoxville in TIFs, pilots, and direct grants. So if you're in commercial construction, you lessen your risk by having somebody else participate with you and effectively put in the cash that's required to close the loan. If you need 25%, of $160 million, how much money do you need? <laughs> how much money did the city give them? So the, the people who ponied up are strong, smart, capable, right? And they had no trouble taking on the debt because the city already put in the cash, right? <laughs> so safety of investment. It's safe to invest for them to build. Until the park got started, until the Iowa Nature Park and, they, and the city began to expand the biking trails, this project didn't start. They had all kinds of reasons. I'm not saying that there are other reasons weren't good. It just happens to be coincidental that the city adds 150 acres of bike trails, <laughs> right? And they start this project. So not only has the city committed all this money to public infrastructure along Sevier Avenue, not only has it created all these parks in South Knoxville, that these people who live in these units will want to use and, and ride their bikes and go walking, right? You've now created a situation in South Knoxville where you have a green effect. Chapman Highway, Moody Avenue, Iams Nature Park, the river. And if you want to talk about gentrification, that's gentrification. I have used the term over the last 20 years, places like Park Ridge are not being gentrified. They are being reoccupied by the people who moved here originally when the neighborhood was built. South Knoxville is a community of thousands of small houses that were factory houses, 800 uh, to 800 square foot, two bedroom, one bath, 950 square foot, three bedroom, one bath. And the people who have lived in that community, will they don't have a prayer of living there. My view, my view, I could be completely wrong. My view is they're on the way out now. And when that place gets open and humming, if you're paying $2,400 a month to live on the water and you have a baby and you like living there, how hard is it for you to move from a 1,400 square foot apartment to a 950 square foot house that you do an addition out the back of it on your 50 foot lot? Or go up, as Joe said. By the right? way, Victor, you know that the waterfront redevelopment area is everything. And I insisted on this. All the way to the ridge tops, the entire view shed. Right. It's, it's over a square mile. And so what happens is, to this point, it only becomes more attractive over time for people to live in South Knoxville in this circled area. Now you can live beyond Moody um, and go up to uh, the Kroger, the Woodlawn up there. You go, go past Stone Road. When you go past Stone Road, you've got to go up over the hill. Nobody's going to drive over that hill on Friday night in the rain. They might Uber it. <laughs> <laughs> this is really important. If you really want to make money in real estate, Look for a $10 Uber ride. And wherever you can ride for $10 or less, right, mm -hmm. buy in that rate. Because what happens is you can drive, you can take an Uber from Cherry Street and Fifth Avenue, the west side, to the Lonesome Dove Cafe for $7.50. <laughs> for $7.50. Mm -hmm. So if you're on Cumberland Avenue, it's $900 a bedroom to live on Cumberland in the new apartments. 
the fork has gone from about 350 to 400 to generally 450 to 600. So if you're a college student, and there's 5,000 more college students this year than there were two years ago that have come to the university campus. If you're one of those people, you now are being pushed out because you can no longer pay. You were paying four, now it's six to live in the four, you can't afford it. So where do you go? Well, Park Ridge is easy, right? Lincoln Park is easy. So you wind up with all these college students who want to pay $400 a bedroom and have 700 credit scores wanting to move into uh, the Park Ridge community because they can get on they can get on Sherry, they can drive around to the Publix and the Walmart on the east on the west side of the campus, right? Get off on Kingston Pike right there, turn left, right in there. One red light, oh, you got yep. two red lights. Two, two take, take the left. Yeah. So let's go back to risk. That was a brownfield that had been an industrial Roman house industrial complex for um, 60 years or 70 years. An unbelievably polluted site. The developers came up with a plan and the tenants, Publix, two good tenants, Publix and Walmart, to develop the site. So I don't remember the total amount of money that was involved, but let's just make, I'm making the numbers up. It's easy to find. Let's call it $100 million. How much money did they get from the city? If it was a $100 million project. 25 million. million. There you go. 20, I think it was 20 million. But, and those numbers may not be right, but the 20% number is right. The 20, 25% number, it is right. And again, it's not about the developers. They wouldn't have built the project. They wouldn't have done the deal if the city hadn't given them the opportunity to do it. But by the city giving them the opportunity to do it, it has changed the dynamic of everybody around them. And so many times, the people that are living in the community do not see it happening to them. They don't understand the market forces that are shaping their lives and they want to blame it on somebody else. And it's, it's just the market forces that have been created by the actions of the politicians in making development go somewhere. So you can't fault Publix, they're doing a bang up job over there. You can't fault Walmart for going over there, right? They've been great for the community, they've been great for the university. People should love, love the Publix. But it's changed the way the people live in East Knoxville. So what happens is that this leads us to any topic on any real estate <laughs> question. We talked about market dynamic. We talked about what's going on. We talked about the millions of dollars that the city's invested in the South Knoxville waterfront and the dynamics. Yes. One more question. Okay. Yep. So where are they going to go? Where is it? The, the people are going to go. It's it's um, like water. It's all about safety. So you'll find some people that will take um, a little more personal risk because they like the idea of adventure, right? And so they'll move into an area that's a little dodgy, but they're making a conscious decision to do that. But because they then have friends who come and visit who are also maybe more affluent, maybe uh, also well-educated, who decide, no, this isn't such a bad place. This is really super convenient. I hate it. And so what happens is Park Ridge has a real market driver in that it's anchored to the old city and it's anchored to the university and it's five minutes around, 12 minutes around on the interstate if you don't catch morning traffic or rush hour traffic. The whole dynamic of what's going on in Park Ridge is being driven by market forces of people who don't live here who are wealthier than the people who live here now who are wanting to move into the area. And the more that the area begins to improve, it accelerates the speed of improvement for the adjoining property owners. Kim Trent used at the MPC meeting, Kim Trent is a wonderful person, she's the head of uh, the Knoxville Preservation Society. Um, Kim is someone who really believes in historic preservation. And she understands the dynamics of historic preservation. And, historic, and she pointed to the concept of uh, there had already been one house sold in Park Ridge for $350,000 and multiple sales over $225,000, over I think she said. So, to your point about the lot, a 50-foot lot is a lot of record in the city of Knoxville. If you are a home builder and you want to build one house and you want to build a house where you can make a little margin, 
you'd want to build a $200,000 house on a $10,000 lot. Where can you buy a $10,000 or $15,000 or $20,000 dollar <coughs> lot and build a $200,000 house for $250,000 and, and Park Ridge? And as soon as they start building those $250,000 houses, you are two or three steps away from $60,000 teardowns. And the reason is, in the, the way that the simple math that builders use, 20 to 25 percent, you cannot exceed 20 to 25 percent lot value to the price of the house you're going to build. So if you say a house sells for $300,000, the lot's worth $60,000. Right? You cannot develop a lot in West Knoxville today for sixty thousand. Put it on the market and sell it for sixty thousand dollars. What's happening in Nashville right now? Uh, Nashville's Nash so we, yeah, we will never be we will never be national. We will never be national. We will never be national. But it's going to get really expensive to live everywhere inside the city limits. The city of Knoxville is continuing to pass regular. The topic of the meeting was the unintended consequences of a beautiful city. And the, I don't want to say the destruction, it's the elimination of affordable housing because you have a wealthier dynamic that views itself to be safer living in a city that has strong regulations. And so as every community looks to invest, so what happens is like an inskip, and the reason that inskip's got a problem is that there's no way to create additional value. There's no, there's no impetus where you can go in and say, we're gonna build a $350,000, $400,000 house. Because there's nothing that's driving what's going on in Inskip. It's, not sort of, it's sort of out there in the nether world with great access, great transportation, but there's no driver. Park Ridge has got a driver. Everything north of Magnolia is a, has got a driver west of Cherry Street, just like Moody Avenue, Chapman, Iron Nature Park, and the River. Those are drivers for everything that's happening inside. It's a $7.50 Uber ride. That's a driver of demand. And the more, and the thing that really drives neighborhood value is when people begin putting signs in their yard that say neighborhood meeting at 7 o'clock. <laughs> because you have an involved neighborhood the police show up. So, the first rule of investing, safety of your person and your children. Second rule of investing, the safety of your money. I'm going to buy something and I'm going to at least get my money back when I sell it. I'm going to have been able to live rent free. I'll take that risk. And then the safety of the future. Look at all the people that are moving into this neighborhood. Look at all the people that are moving into these other neighborhoods. They're just like us. They're just like we want to be, right? They're all college educated. They're all this, they're all that. And you wind up with a situation that rents continue to increase because people feel safer paying more money in rent. They don't want to own, they want to live there for a little while. And it's better to live in this neighborhood than it might be to live in some other neighborhood that's a little further out, like North Hills. North Hills is a great, wonderful area, right? but it doesn't quite have the economic drivers that Park Ridge has got. So you wind up with a whole range of topics. People make them, again, how people have the time, I just don't get it. Uh, I, I wish I had that kind of time. <laughs> but what happens is you see people talking to each other, and they're talking about real estate investors, they're talking about uh, these, this person, that person, making some kind of observation. And so, the information that I'm sharing is the same exact information that I use for myself, that I tell, I've told um, other investors to use on a regular basis that come to our meetings. Uh, we encourage everybody to come. It doesn't cost to come to one of our real meetings, by the way. Uh, don't want to tell anybody it's free and we don't supply pizza. We, we, do, we do poor sliders. <laughs> so, um, these are the typical questions. And so, um, if anybody's got any question on anything in real estate, it doesn't make any difference what it is. We still have uh, about 20 to 30 minutes. Yes? Just wondering about the historical uh, overlay. In reading your article that you've written, that you're passing around, it sounds like you're not in support of it. Can you talk about that some? So, um, 
if everybody, I, I, I printed up four of these, uh, five of these, I don't remember, but everybody can pass them around and look at them. Um, the, uh, in two, so in 2002, um, uh, I was approached by a house in uh, Old North Knoxville. And the house, the, uh, it was 95 or something like that, when the historic district went into Old North. So it had been going on for about five, seven years. It was we were really beginning to accelerate the way that it was moving. More involved people had restored their homes. More people were wanting to enforce it. And the person who owned the house at 1012 Thompson Place um, didn't want to own it anymore. Uh, he had problems with codes people. He had problems with um, uh, the Historic Zoning Society. People were uh, driving by and complaining all the time about the way his house looked. And a nightmare. So this is what it looked like in September of uh, 2002, uh, September 2007, uh, 2001, and this is the side they put a door in up in the attic and had a metal fire escape coming down the side. <coughs> and so um, he, somebody that I had known for a long time, been a lot of business with over the years, and he said, Victor, I don't want this house anymore. Would you buy it from me for $30,000? So I did. And it had been a triplex, it had been a triplex, it had three meters on it. It would have been a triplex forever. But as I got into it, the um, neighborhood, when they found out somebody else owned it, they all wanted to, every, everybody wanted to be involved in, you know, we wanted to be a single family house, we wanted to be this, we wanted to be that. And so I got started with the project with the intent of making it a really nice triplex, maybe a duplex. And so, while we were doing the construction, while we were doing the, the work, I, I began looking at the historic zoning that would be in place. And I didn't do it correctly because I was in the process. I had a great architect <laughs> uh, who, uh, if, uh, he had, if I had listened to him at the time, I would have gotten a federal tax credit. But I was already into the project. And we were already doing the demolition because the house was in terrible condition. Because once the upstairs unit had caught on fire, had a stove fire, and that person had left. The other two people who were living downstairs were both mentally challenged. Both of them walked to the, uh, one walked to, was a CNA at the hospital, and the other one was a, uh, uh, did something with Kroger at the Fleeny Kroger. So they needed to live there. public transportation, close to work, but the neighbors didn't want them there. <laughs> I'm buying the house, right? I'm, I'm going to spend some money to fix it up. <laughs> so I'm, the way I make everybody move, I write them a check and tell them that uh, their lease is not going to be renewed. And I hope I can hope you can find something else that'll give you some more money. So those people left. I subsequently spent $250,000 on that house. It was spectacular when we finished it. So if you read the article, what happened was, and uh, you can flip through and look at some of the pictures, we were working on doing the demo, and we were all there. And the, set the, the peak of the roof collapsed. The, there, was, there had been another chimney that had been taken out Everybody knows how many decades ago, and there was a back stairwell that had been jerry rigged. And when we started doing demo work, you know, we, there was no inclination at all that we were removing anything, and boom, this all comes down. So the whole center of the house collapsed. Uh, it destroyed everything. Went to the ground. We wound up putting something like 45 floor jacks back in the house. Um, it's a George Barber home, by the way. If anybody wants, this is, if you want to write this down, this is, uh, if you want to watch, if you got 35 minutes to kill, uh, you can Google, um, nothing changes in real estate, historic park ridge. And it should pop up uh, the YouTube video on 
uh, how Park Ridge was actually created. The, the land transaction that created Park Ridge. And some of you will find that interesting. Can you say that one more time? Uh, it's, uh, um, nothing changes in real estate. Historic Park Ridge. Or nothing new in real estate. Nothing changes in real estate. I can't remember which way it is. But you know, it should pop right up. And if not, you can go to the go to YouTube, type in Knox Ria, and uh, the show. It's on our channel. But it's it's interesting as to how Park Ridge was created by a land transaction at the time that it was created, and who moved into Park Ridge at the time that it did. Right. So, so you like the historic overlay that you were involved in over there. So what happens is, as an investor, I can tell you with 100% certainty, I'll make more money. 100% I make more money. And I even think, I mean, let me tell you, I was telling Brian who grabbed an over, there was no appraisal on this. On the, the, the appraiser that did the appraisal for the bank when I bought it estimated the repairs at $56,000. <laughs> my, my first number before the roof collapsed, the first, my first number was $118,000. I'm <laughs> more than double <laughs> what, the, what the bank's appraisal was. So what? So when I got into it, and all the neighbors go you know, right down to Armstrong, and all the neighbors, you know, all excited about the program. So we just moved forward with it. So and when the roof collapsed, it showed the original Cypress timbers that the house had been built with. So the people that built that house. It was a grand house when it was built. So you could see the original hallway that had been designed for air circulation, because there, there were the cypress walls, they were just right there. And so we began to open the house up, we began to modify the inside of it. If I listened to my really good architect, I would have not done anything to build architectural plans. But what happened was, um, I began, as I began to modify the house, if you're going to change and meet the character of the uh, historic overlay, you're spending 40, 50, 60 percent more money. In this house, and you can read it in the documents, I wanted to use uh, smooth party plan, and they wouldn't let me. Uh, the cornices that are here on, uh, we had all of those redone. Uh, at the top of the columns, and they cost $700 a piece. Jeez. I could have had the cornices from across the street, same people, $200. But because of this house, I couldn't do it in the, at Knoxville. I had to use the more expensive cornices. In for a penny, in for a pound, next. So um, I, I converted, um, this was the master, this is the master bedroom wing right here. So it's a 16 by 22 master bedroom. There's a uh, 10 by 14 walk-in, 10 by 16 walk-in closet. There's a walk-in shower. There's a soaking tub. 10 foot ceilings. It's a nice house. You still have it? No. Uh, it, uh, it became part of uh, 2011. So it's, uh, I rented it for $2,500 a month from the time we got it finished. It was ready for $3,000 a month in 2009. It was the, uh, how, it was the, uh, in 2005, it made the, uh, hit, uh, the Christmas tour that they did in Old North, and it was voted the house of the tour. Right? Every Christmas, I think about what happened to those people that I evicted out of. I paid to leave that house. I know they don't live in Park Ridge. I know they don't live in Fort Gill, right? So to your point, I can tell you, as an investor, I make more money. But as somebody who is interested in diversity of housing, who grew up in a three-room apartment, I've been very blessed in life. So when I hear somebody say, I don't want those people in the neighborhood, I used to be one of those people. Amen. So uh, I'm really sensitive to those issues. So I know without question that a historic zoning overlay will increase property values. It will bring more people into the neighborhood who are better educated and by definition they are wealthier 
and the people who live here today because you're adding a set of federal government restrictions where there are no restrictions today. And no realtor can sell you a home in a historic district without telling you what the restrictions are, and you are therefore choosing to live in that neighborhood and live with those restrictions. And most people, the reason they're buying into that neighborhood is now it's safe. The government is setting up the restrictions, and everybody who moves in after me has got to live with those same restrictions. So by definition, everybody who moves in second is wealthy, is, is as smart or wealthier, as smart as they are, and wealthier because they're buying the houses from those people, right? Mm -hmm. So you have an accelerating timeline, and it depends on where you are in the United States. You'll hear, uh, and uh, Knoxville, Tennessee is really fortunate to have uh, Kate Graybill in uh, uh, at the MVC over the historic zoning. She's really, really uh, an excellent person to talk to and to work with. And there's, you'll see and hear people talk about, you can't determine whether it's historic zoning that uh, is creating the, the change in the neighborhood or whether it's market forces. And it's hard to find somebody who says that market forces um, are the reason that they bought or it was historic zoning the reason they bought. I can tell you as an investor, Three years ago, um, it became really evident that this was a changing neighborhood because this historic zoning overlay was being talked about. It looked like it was going to go to a city council vote sometime or the other. There was no city in America who voted against historic zoning. You're moving people into a neighborhood who are better educated and wealthier. What does that mean? They vote. They need fewer social services. There's fewer police. There's fewer fire calls. What city could possibly be against the expansion of historic zoning? <laughs> so you're talking about both and. You're talking about the market forces and you're talking about the policy, right? It, right. They, they, they're meshed together. They work together and that's, that's, it's, it's not one or the other. You can't have one without the other to have the effect that you're talking about. But what you're not really talking about is where did the mentally challenged people go? What, what, what policy implications are there for that? What, we know what to do to help out and accommodate the better educated and the and more wealthy. Right. But there's policy, there's, there's a historic overlay. What's the overlay for those people? Uh, there isn't one. And more importantly, so there's not one, to take this issue of affordable housing. So last year, this was a topic, this topic was the first part of last year. So eight, 18 months ago is when we had this topic at the real meeting, right? That I'm talking about the unintended consequences of a beautiful city, the future of affordable housing. At that meeting, I said by the end of 2017, there'll be a thousand people without a Section 8, who have a Section 8 voucher who cannot find a place to live. I, I spoke with Debbie Taylor Allen a couple of weeks ago, before the meeting, three weeks ago, 774 people have got a Section 8 voucher and cannot find a place to live. Already. Already, yes. Um, I uh, <clears throat> I know people that have a whole lot of money that won't touch a property in section or with a historic overlay because of all of the restrictions that are so unnecessary. Um, in fact, I know of uh, Linden Avenue Baptist Church, for example, was trying to build a covered entryway for one of their handicapped people, and Kay made it a living H-E double hockey sticks with regulations and it cost to that church I don't know how many more thousands of dollars because they wanted to tell them where to put the bushes they wanted to tell them what kind of roof they wanted to tell it was just Again, horrible so, so to, this, to this point right, those are regulations that everybody can read that are invisible for everybody so if you're coming into an area you're going to read those regulations and you're going to say man I really like that I know, I know that but anybody the people that are living there don't want it. Okay, so again, I'm not. I'm just talking about the result of what happens. So to, to the point of the people that are living there, that's the reason I say it's a five or seven year cycle. That within five to seven years of an overlay going in, the people that are generally living there don't live there anymore. Sometimes it might. And what happens is, by the way, this is really interesting because um, sir, first off, I can speak. I always try. To, speak about something that I have first-hand knowledge of. So I have first-hand knowledge of historic preservation, historic rebuilding, the kind of money that you can spend, and why you should do it. 
Because, I mean, it's hard to buy anything in Old North Knoxville, right? So doing this house contributed to the overall value of everybody else's property. So you wind up with a situation that, as I mentioned, oh, there's my favorite picture of the house on the face. Um, the, um, so in, this is my, so I know that college students will move into an area that is historic because my daughter went to the College of Charleston. And uh, she, she's my only daughter, so she's completely spoiled. She used to get hurt, get a little cut or something. We had, oh, God, we took that to the emergency room. One of my boys get hurt, I'll throw some dirt on it. Let's go. No problem. No problem with that. Man, God. So when she went to the College of Charleston, she wanted to live in the historic zone because it was close to the college. It was great architecture, interesting people living there. I really didn't care what it cost. She wanted to live there. She said she was safe, and she was, right? Close to school. So she moved from where I would like for her to have lived in a gated apartment community with 24-hour security, a great gym, right? <laughs> Wonderful facilities, fantastic clubhouse. I couldn't understand why she wouldn't live there. So she now lives in Nashville uh, on Elmington Park, which is on the west end about three miles from Vanderbilt Hospital, three miles from Vanderbilt Hospital. And Elmington Park, there was an original Elmington Park, and it expanded back in um, the late 90s to a much larger area. So now, so it's all historic zone, right? But the original, the original Elmington Park, I keep pointing this because it's, it's a nice visual. The original Elmington Park <coughs> now is the more historic Elmington Park, and you, charge, you get charged a premium for living there because they were the original <laughs> historic <laughs> overlay. So um, they, they just did a, next, next to my daughter's house, there was a 50, it's a 50 foot lot, um, where she, she's renting over it, and where she's renting, next, uh, they're right across from the park, and there was a 50 foot house, a 50 foot wide lot, that had been combined in two 25 foot side lots from these other two houses. And this happens, brick, nasty looking yellow brick rancher was built in like 1975. It wasn't anything like anything else on the street. It became a, last year, it was a $400,000 teardown. $400,000. So when people say that the historic overlay will slow the demolition of houses, it's only a momentary lull as more properties go through the cycle of the owners not being able to keep them and they move out. The rental properties become vacant, somebody sells the rental property, just like the, the house on Thompson, somebody comes in and restores it because they have confidence in the community and they rent it for a rate of return that they're happy with with an appreciation of value going forward. So, so where do those people go? Uh, that's the city's problem, isn't it? That can't be my problem. I think as a rich real estate investor, it is your problem. So to your point, it I, is my problem. So so to your point exactly, I did a, a remodel to the house uh, that you know about. It was about seventy sixty thousand dollars. I wanted to move people into the house. So it's there's a two thousand dollar refrigerator. I mean this house is beautiful. I mean it's so it's, nice. a, it's a five bedroom, two bath house, hardwood floors. I had all the hardwood floors refinished, ten foot ceiling. Um, it was nice. <laughs> it's um, a good two thousand dollars stainless steel refrigerator. I mean, thank you for coming. Is it still there? It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And uh, so, <clears throat> I, I specifically looked for people who weren't in the system. I told Debbie that I was going to make an effort, uh, but I didn't want to rent to Section Eight. Uh, specifically, I was looking for somebody that was working that wanted to have a place that was really nice, better than some place that they probably lived before. To your point exactly, I can afford to take less money and rent on that house and move on, right? So I, uh, there were four people um, that uh, had between them three kids, and they were all working, and they all wanted, they all came, so they, they fell in love with the house. They wanted everything they could to, to get the house, to get in the house. And so, 
They all agreed to pay uh, rent, and it was $1,200 a month. Um, and uh, they move in, and almost immediately, her sister has some kind of problem. She's homeless, and she brings her, so she and her three kids come to live in the house also. I think that was within a week. Maybe it was. It was in a short, within a short period of time. Yeah. We live across the street. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering if I knew someone. <laughs> yeah. So. If I'd have had the number, I'd have called him. What was going on? So, so to fast forward, I carried them as long as I could carry them losing money in the hope that they would be able to find another job, find another roommate, find somebody that would do something. And all that was happening was the people who were able to pay were struggling to pay $300 or $500 or $700. Well, my cost on the house is significantly more money. So at some point, you've got to say enough is enough. So I told them, don't pay me any more rent. Don't pay me any more money. Just be out in 90 days. I've got 90 days. Save whatever money you've got. Find someplace else to move. They moved in about 110 days, but they didn't move. The problem, the problem was, not only did I give up the rent, poor Trent, there would be no meeting tonight, by the way, if it wasn't for Trent Huggins. Trent is the guy that does everything. And uh, so He worked hard on that house. He worked unbelievable to get that mess cleaned up. It was a mess. I, I've got pictures of it, and it's just, it's appalling to me the condition they left the house in. I mean, and isn't it appalling that those children lived in that? Yeah. I mean, he talked about the smell from the refrigerator. Oh, it's unbelievable. Well, and so, so not, not to be talking about the house, but it's it's a nicely done, furnished. I mean, there's a uh, the washer dryer or um, like twelve or fifteen hundred dollar washer dryer. And they were still there. Stuff. Yeah, it's still there. Stay uh, the stove. I mean, the stove's you know stuff. I mean, it's a five thousand dollar appliance package up in that house. Uh, so, to the point, at some point, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. So we get the house cleaned back up. We, um, I, I'm glad Trent works for free. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we got the house cleaned up, went back in, had to repaint the entire house a couple thousand dollars. Uh, had to redo the floors. Um, we uh, so I tried one more time. Now I could have rented it for $1,600 in one day. No question in my mind, one day. But I make one more effort to rent it to somebody who's, um, and where it would have been, we couldn't find this, I would have rented a Section 8 tenant a second time, but we couldn't find one who could move timely, who could qualify, and who had a $1,300 voucher. So, um, I tell Trent, let's try it one more time, we're gonna advertise it for $1,200. One more time. So Trent handles all the showings. He, after me moving the other people in, he told me I wouldn't not show property anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so so Trent shows the property and anything he decides I'm good with. And the people that are in there now showed up. They have great credit scores. They have um, they're wonderful, nice people. They take impeccable care of the house, right? Good people. Good people, and so I could have, if I if the rent had been sixteen hundred dollars, they would have still taken the house. But because I advertised it at twelve hundred, right? Because I'm looking for that working person where you can get three or four working people together, and they're working on Magnolia Avenue somewhere, and they need to be able to walk to work. Um, we advertised it for twelve hundred dollars. You can't say or at least I don't think I could ever say to someone that walks up that's got a credit score that's uh, female that um, wants to pay the advertised rent, nope, you can't rent for that. We've got to charge you more money because you've got a good job and a college education. Right? I don't think I can do that. I might try to do that, but Trent wouldn't let me. I'm a bleeding heart for those children. I have worked with similar children for the last six years. And your story about your daughter in college, that was wonderful. But I know he's not a little boy anymore. 
that when he was a little boy, he was taken to downtown Knoxville, and he saw an escalator for the first time, and he was like, what is that? And when someone mentioned UT to him, he said, what's UT? He had no clue. Right. You know, and I guess I just want to know that the children that live in Park Ridge now are going to be okay. In <coughs> Again, you're, you're dealing with social issues. So, I've got opinions on any real estate topic. So, but not children. The problem no, is, the, the problem is, you can't fix all those problems. You can't. Nobody in here can fix all those problems. And but is there no balance between the two worlds? You know what I mean? So what happens? What happens is the city uh, continues to add additional regulations mm -hmm. to um, make it a more beautiful city. They add sign regulations. They add. Um, and the sign, all signs, all sign regulations do is increase the number of uh, chain stores and the number of high value boutique stores. Victor, you might want to mention how a lot of these housing issues are unintended consequences of the Dodd Frank Act. So, um, I was having a conversation with Brian. Um, and Brian, by the way, is a shopping center developer. He does Walgreens locations and he does, he does the big retail. I do a little bit of this, he does big. So um, the, the Dodd-Frank Act, wanting to protect everybody in the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, the Dodd-Frank Act says that, um, and I'm summarizing, that resi new residential construction is speculative investing by the bank, is a speculative loan by the bank. And they have to allocate more of their capital to do single family, speculative construction. So a home builder who wants to go out and build a spec house, it used to be that you, if they, uh, they could buy a lot and they could borrow 75 to 80 percent of the anticipated sale price of the house. In today's world, they're buying, they're borrowing about 45 or 50 percent of that value and that cash shortfall eliminates the small builders. So all of the lot development in Knoxville almost exclusively is being either done by national builders, super regional builders, um, and or uh, families that have got the capital to do a 50 lot subdivision as a family. There's no small, the small builders are almost without exception being eliminated everywhere in the United States. But historically, 75 to 80 percent of the homes in America have been built by small builders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a complete reversal. And so the big builders create the big track homes, they get the big efficiencies, build with speed, the, the cookie cutter look of all of the subdivisions. So if you're, if you're again, you're 30 years old, 32, 34, 35 years old, you live in a but you've got a couple of kids, um, you like where you live, but you're looking for something a little unique, you go buy a subdivision, you know, subdivision 250 homes that have got four floor plans, or do you go to South Knoxville and buy one of those really cute bundles? Smith, yeah. <laughs> Joseph? I mean, Go ahead. I mean, you can blame the city. I mean, if you're going to blame somebody, blame the city because it, it's a simultaneously they could project or they could work on some type of plan for Section 8 housing. Well, the, 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 it, always, it always gets well, the same. Thing. So what happens is you just you, you wind up and I mean, putting it on the transportation lines. Well, they did that on, on that little subdivision yeah. on, um, oh, whatever, I'll shut up. But I mean, that's their, that's their okay. office. So, well, the place they had moved is Inskip. Well, yeah. uh, it, it, Inskip would have been perfect, right? Seriously. Well, so they sold but, a bunch but you wind up with a situation like where you look, there's 4,000 Section 8 vouchers in the city. 4,000, right? University. And you've got 20% of the Section 8 vouchers cannot find a place to live. That, by definition, is a crisis. And then you've got all these people, places that people want to do more, but you can't get more densities of them in uh, the city. Or in the county. I mean, you try to, all of Southwest Knox County, 75,000 people from um, uh, South Peters, um, uh, where the Walgreens is, Kingston Pike, all the way to the uh, to the river, to the county line. 75,000 people in, the, in Southwest Knox County. Uh, it, if it were a city, it would be. I think it's. I think this is still correct. The wealthiest city in the state of Tennessee as a city. Uh, 
there is not one piece of property in that entire area zoned for medium density residential. Not my, my 3.7 acres, but outside of my 3.7 acres, <laughs> nothing is zoned. So you couldn't build a fourplex, a duplex, you can't do it without, you can't do it. Yes. Um, some of these other cities that have become more beautiful, like Nashville, Charlotte, Asheville, um, and have gone through the historical overlay and the market factors, what has happened to the unintended consequences of people that live they there? They have no they're, they're, They wanted to be homeless. Uh, so Nashville um, has, um, uh, Nashville is a little different because of um, the way the, the commuter cities work. It builds out a little bit more. They have a little larger bus line. Um, they, but they wouldn't approve um, a bus transit system a few years ago because the, they didn't want those people riding through their neighborhood. That's what actually, like you said, it means. Uh, so, so the answer to your question is they become, uh, they, they move in with friends, they move in with relatives, uh, they, they live in a shelter, or they become homeless. Yes? Something that I haven't heard mentioned yet, it's not on that list, of course there's lots of things that are on the list, you don't, you don't get it to be a comprehensive list, but um, and it may come up with the recoding of you know, the Knoxville Zoning Code, but that's ADU, accessory dwelling units, and a <laughs> lot, it's, a, it's another hot topic, it's going to be a tough one, but... Everybody understand what accessory dwelling units are? That's it. Yeah, garage apartments, nanny, nanny, granny, where you have a lot of apartment the garage. Right. I, I can tell you that that is to be a real, really hot topic because picking and choosing where with the zone that we have now. So you'll hear people talk about they, you're going to you're going to do uh, form based codes as form based codes begin to uh, spread out across the communities. What people in the communities don't understand about form-based codes. They don't really, just like I'm talking about 2,400 jobs at $80,000 a year, nobody in the room but one knew about it, right? And how that's gonna impact Knoxville. Neighborhoods hear form-based codes. People might have heard about the uranium processing facility, but to say it's gonna create 2,400 direct jobs, 5,000 other jobs, right? What impact does that have? A lot. Form-based codes, everything that's inside that building, as long as it, it looks good, right? It matches the form that the people have picked, someone else has picked for the street. Anything you want to do inside that building is, is absolutely possible. So as long as it's not toxic or um, hazardous in some way, you can do whatever you want to in the building. You can have a sewing, you can have, you can have a sewing warehouse, you can do, you can have retail, you can have restaurants. You can have anything. And it can be eight stories tall. But that's, so, pure, that's pure form based code, though. You can hybridize it, you can restrict uses to some degree or not. have a lot of choices there. I was in, I was in Denver recently, and I love they have, you know, they, they've allowed it 80 years. And even in historic zones, now they have controls, lots of controls. So, what, so to follow up, again, goes back to the point of what is what is personal responsibility, right? So if I'm wanting to rebuild an asset base and I'm wanting to create, uh, uh, I'm willing to take risk and I'm willing to do the work that is required to understand what the rules are and I'm willing to take all of my chips every single day and bet red or black. So I take all my chips every day, red, black, red, black. And I begin to make money with the decisions that I've made and the risk that I've taken. At what point do I begin to say, well, I don't need to take any more risk. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to take any more risk. I'm not going to create any more housing. I'm not going to take any more risk. I'm not going to remodel any more houses so that the houses improve. The more regulations that you have on property, the harder it is for people who do not have um, a, a base of income to be able to accumulate the money that it takes to be able to live in that neighborhood. Exactly. And the situation that the city is creating is that there's no, sub the subsidies that the city has for housing 
create a situation that more poor people live in a neighborhood. They buy a lot, they redo the house, they give somebody a grant for fifty or sixty thousand dollars to move into a new house. Beautifully designed, fantastic home, hundred and sixty, hundred and seventy thousand dollars. But the city gives the person moving in sixty thousand dollars so they can qualify for a ninety-five or hundred thousand dollar loan. So you've got a hundred and sixty thousand dollar house to build selling for $100,000 with a $60,000 subsidy to a poor person. They can't, and they, it's, it's a struggle for them to afford the payment for the $100,000. But now you not only have you moved another poor person into the neighborhood, you now have destroyed the value opportunities for the other houses because the <coughs> appraisal comparable, right, is going to go down. So you wind up with a situation that if you want to build a similar house at market rate, you can never get an appraisal. Real estate housing is based on values which have occurred in the past. 60 days ago, 90 days ago, four months ago. Comparable values do not have to be in the same school district. They can be different. Basically, appraisers take, um, they start with a round peg, which is the subject property, and they look for other round pegs, and if they don't find another round peg, they start taking different kinds of pegs and rounding, changing the edges of them until it becomes round. Right? Make an adjustment for this or make an adjustment for that. But the bottom line is, every judgment that they're making is on something that has occurred in the past. Every appraisal that it is for a resident for a house is based on information that's in the MLS system. So you're not going to believe this, but realtors make mistakes when they enter that data. And so the house is calculated in the wrong square footage. You wind up with the the problems of helping the poor exacerbate the problem of being able to turn a neighborhood around. If you were really wanting to help the poor, you would begin buying houses in uh, any neighborhood in Knoxville that you could buy for $250,000 uh, or $300,000 and letting four or five working people, six working people who were sharing three cars live in that house. But the city's passed rules against that. Yep. <laughs> It's in Athens, which is, I know, not a desirable part. It's in the better part of Athens. <laughs> if you're in just the north side where the farms are, it's really nice. Um, she bought this house three years ago. It was a, an owner finance, and she put $15,000 down. She paid $2,800 a month faithfully for three years. She, her intention was to finance the house at the end and buy it. Well, she lost uh, a business opportunity that she had down in Florida, and she filed a loss on her taxes. So this changed her DTI, and she can't get a loan to buy the house. So she's got, like, till the end of the week to get a contract on the house. And I, I, got, I, got, uh, I got about five things here on it. It's 4,371 square feet. It's a five-bedroom, four-and-a-half bath. Full car, double two double car garages, uh, seven acres of land. It's got a pool. It's landscaped. No renovations needed. Everything in the house has been totally upgraded. It's a beautiful house. They had it listed. Zillow has it for uh, five ninety nine. She listed it for five fifty, and I have until the end of the week. She'll take four ninety nine. So if there's any investors that want to buy the property, they can rent, she's out of it, they can rent it for $2,500 or whatever until you can sell it for what it's worth. I mean, it's it's close to a $600,000. So if anybody's interested, please come grab one and we can see if we can make it happen. I told like I mentioned it tonight, I said, I, I know time is short, we only have a couple of days to do this or, or she's gonna be completely lost all of her investment. If I get somebody tonight that says they at least want to see it and are interested, then we can buy time. If I can't get anybody tonight until I call it tomorrow, if I can't get anybody in the meeting that, that at least wants to see the house and is interested in it, then, then she's going to be out. Um, Jeff, you're going to
recommend it. We just definitely did that right. Uh, I recommend it. I mentioned this in one of the posts, but to your issue of housing, where people live, how are they going to live? I recommend this book right here. It's, the book is Evicted. Um, the, it's about um, five families, six families that uh, live in Milwaukee, about the same size as Knoxville, and what goes on in Milwaukee um, and how they live. It's um, if, if you read um, Hillbilly Elegy, it's got a lot of play. This tells you where the people who are in Hillbilly Elegy, the, the other, it's really interesting to see how the, the three books work together. You know, Hillbilly Elegy, Evicted, and a book called White Trash. Um, but if you really want to understand the problem with what we're talking about tonight, uh, this guy's name is Matthew Desmond, E-S-M-O-N-D. Um, and he uh, is one of those people that when he writes, uh, uh, he lives with the people. So it's actually from his own accounts of living with the people over a two-year period of time. And it deals with these very issues. Where do people live? How do they live? And why do they live that way? So it's a really, really good book for people that are interested in these kind of housing issues uh, to have a grasp of and a grip on. Um, anybody else have a pizza they wanted? Yes? A uh, quick question about comps. You mentioned how residential, how they're estimated from prior sales, what, about six months or so. In, in a perfect world, they want within 30 days and six months. Yeah. How does that work with the commercial start getting the value or trying to get a feel of the value before you purchase? Because there may not be times for the last right. six months. Commercial, commercial property is almost always valued on the, you know, on the income that it's currently generating or the anticipated income that it's going to be generating. So you can have a dollar general store that compares to a dollar general store anywhere in the United States because it's dollar general, right? But if you look at like a little strip shopping center, it's got a beauty parlor and an salon. And um, that's your part of it. You, you can only value it on what that income is from those tenants as to what kind of rate of return you'd be looking for. For other properties, not only Right. So, if, if, if they don't show up at the city council meeting, It'll get, it, it'll get approved without question. So if you are against the open line, you need to absolutely positively be contacted with the city council people. Let people understand why you don't support them. I can't do that. For those in law enforcement, doing the best I have. Before I, before I forget, everybody who's unsolicited, look, this is Rick Mixon, one of, if not the best architect in Knoxville. So, uh, but this is with the housing development corporation, the nonprofit builds and sells the low moderate income. So our appraisals are, we're doing 110, half a sale for 110 to get the low moderate income. From what they're paying for, our cook sales are half. We've got 650 a month. We've got other utility bills only 100 bucks a month, average. And so uh, the city only sets by the 30,000. Uh, so we, we can sell them for 110 by the end. We have about 137, and uh, so that's one of the best we've ever heard But when our houses sell, they, they are the appraisal. They, they are the appraisal? Yeah, because nothing else in the neighborhood is, is right. 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 This is Rick Mixon. Uh, he's an architect and a longtime friend. So he knows more about building, and he runs and showed up, and he, just, he does great work. Brilliant guy. Uh, but the, I wish you okay. you <laughs> <laughs> but what but what happens is well he, he's got a nonprofit that builds these new houses that are beautiful houses and it just becomes really difficult for those houses to ever it, they create their own comp mm -hmm. but you can't move another house forward based on that comp mm -hmm. because it, it's sold it's a subsidized sale. But they not getting the second mortgage in the bag. I have a question that maybe he can address. Um, I called Kay about two weeks ago. We are looking to change our insurance coverage, change companies. Right. And so I'm getting estimates from people and that sort of thing. And one of the real estate, or one of the insurance people I talked to asked me, 
well, are you wanting like historical insurance to wear? And it was a greater amount, of course, right. to meet all the historical bills. Um, and I said, point. well, I don't really know what I want. And she said, so I called Kay just to get a kind of an idea. And Kay told me that like if we were to have a fire and lost everything on our lot, right. um, we would only be allowed to rebuild on 30%, like the, the dwelling can only cover 30% of the lot. Yeah, you, you'd never be able to re rebuild. Which and looking at our, our you know, duplex. I, I meant to point this out earlier. It's um, That's horrible. <laughs> the, the historic zoning overlay, one of the unintended consequences is you can't get it. A lot of companies will not write insurance. Yeah. Uh, so you wind up being limited to the coverage that you're going to carry. And the reason is that what you have, so let's go back to comparable values. I don't want to be getting too weedy here. Uh, but comparable values are for existing structures selling with existing structures. Everybody's heard about the, the classic examples, the fires were up in Pigeon uh, Gatlinburg where they can't rebuild, right? Because they've got to meet the new current toast. Sonoma County, California, uh, out there in Santa Rosa, there are about 5,800 residences that were burned completely. There's nothing left. Uh, they were interviewing a, a Farm Bureau uh, agent who has about 400 homes insured, and he said that between 300 and 350 of his houses will not be able to be rebuilt because they don't have enough insurance to meet the new California code. They had enough insurance to, to if, if, if theirs was the only house to be damaged, they would have had enough insurance, right, because they were comparing to the other houses in the neighborhood, but you're not going to be able to rebuild in that neighborhood now um, with any of those houses because of the, of the California code. So there's going to be four or 5,000 people that live in Santa Rosa that aren't going to live there anymore because they're about to be, all that land's going to be bought up by other people uh, because they've changed all the zoning codes. There won't be any more manufacturing, I can assure you, there will not be another 100 unit manufactured home community in Santa Rosa. Right. Right. So it's the same issue. Um, the historic zone puts on additional unknown future costs. Right. Exactly. And you are insuring against an unknown cost. It's also stating, if I understood it correctly, that I absolutely cannot rebuild my four square duplex or even the four square house that's no, going to no. look anything like what I've lost. No. And I'm like, well, how is that right? Uh, that's, again, these are new zoning laws that are in place. It would be the new zoning regulations that would be in place. And it's not a question of whether it's right or not. It's what the new laws are. That's not so the new zoning. zoning. That's the existing zoning. It's R1A. Gives you 30% yeah, lot, lot coverage. So with the, with the zoning that's in place, which was a change in the zoning prior to um, when the R1A zoning went in. So your house was built at a time that, that there were lots of new places in line for that. But there's in the zone, there's some of the standard lots that are less than 75 feet wide. Um, you still have that same lot coverage. Yeah, Changed. But it's, but it's still, you can't have more than 30% like them. Can you get it? Yeah, and in the city, yeah. that means roof area. Yeah. And so, so what happened, and so the city last year, or this year, this year, changed the driveway code. So you can no longer have a gravel driveway, or the driveway has to be pavers or concrete. Um, so, you know, it adds $3,000 to $4,000 to the cost of just adding a paver driveway. Um, concrete driveway. So, mm -hmm. That, that's, that was told to me by somebody who no longer builds in the city. They used to build in the city and they don't build in the city anymore. Um, so, I don't want to run anybody up, but we've got, we've got to clean up. Uh, well, thank you for your time. So, if anybody's got any questions, it's easy to reach, for sure.